the okay so we go um chapter six so um um yes this is uh, the the test inside of this is something that's quite close to my heart um um the reproducible environment stuff is obviously quite important but um um i i i don't feel sufficiently um experienced with docker to to really um extol its virtues um but i know i, I mean i know a little bit about our end and we can briefly talk about that towards the end but um yeah docker's a bit of a new world for me and, and, and on friday on friday like i've used docker for like a week and a half now um friday i'd been using it for like seven days and the project that i was working on i'd made so many um containers to kind of update the environments just to get an app to run and things like that i made so many changes and so i basically just wiped out my hard drive like 200 gigs gone in like the space of a day because um because i didn't realize how much cleanup i would need to do with docker um but anyway i imagine that happens to a lot of people um so there's a lot of there's a lot of tools mentioned in this chapter um largely uh related to um testing so th there's a few different types of uh, uh, of testing approaches talked about um and there's various tools related to each of those um they also mentioned docker and our and and docker stats which is a a way to get um information about the you know the amount of memory and, and things like that that are used by a container during the run of an app um but yeah I'll, I'll i'll try and talk about each of these briefly um so um so at the moment so like the the, the kind of um the um mindset of the book is that your app should be structured like a package and that um when it's structured like that um you it, you it it makes it easier to use tools that have been developed for the development of our packages which is a perfectly reasonable standpoint so particularly when it comes to things like um testing and, and documentation and things like that there are really good tools available in, in the r ecosystem for that um foremost amongst the testing tools is test that um but test that is kind of designed for testing um um uh, the kind of input output type functions the 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 um, pure functions that compute some value um whereas a lot of the um a lot of the uh what makes shiny work is the reactive context and the um the uh the link from the user interface to the server at the back end how modifying values on one side of that partition affects things that are computed on the other side and how um uh you know updating one value on the server side may lead to the update of a, a, a range of other values on there that kind of reactivity that kind of interaction with the user and things like that really aren't things that test that was originally designed for um but there are helpers that have been developed by the you know the, in the the shiny uh sphere that uh, like extensions of test that that mean that it you know that that reactivity at least can be done within test that and the expectation functions that that are available within test that are available to you when you're testing a shiny app so we'll talk about testing in in, in quite a bit of detail i probably could have split this uh section up into a few different pages really um yeah so it's, they talk about um testing 
four main as well sorry in the book they actually only talk about three main aspects so it's the business logic which are, are the 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 pure functions the the things that convert some input into some output and you test that the the value output by that is uh, consistent with what you expected there is no reactive context there's no user interaction or anything like that um, when you're testing these kind of functions um, they also discuss testing the user interface or the user kind of interactivity type stuff so that uh, what the the testing tools that are relevant in that setting are typically things that are uh, driven by you know JavaScript uh, sort of node-based tools and stuff. Um, though Shiny itself provides a, a package called Shiny Test that um, allows you to record kind of user sessions um, uh, on on an app. Um, one thing that isn't actually mentioned in the 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 intro to this chapter, but which is a is is discussed in the in the concept is the kind of the link from so the, the reactive links between different parts of your server function so um those kind of things can also be tested now using shiny and 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 i'll, I'll go through an example of of that uh, to expand upon what was in the book because in the book the book must have been written at a point before um the shiny driver tool was available uh, and then also the stuff about application load i'm not going to talk about that but it, it was very interesting to see um anyway so testing the business logic um so these are non-reactive functions um and you know based on how we've organized the app these are separated from interactive and reactive logic um so we can use tools like test that and we can use the you know the test um, function within DevTools to run test that um, in the same way that you would if you were developing a package. This is uh, what I've got here is a kind of updated version of a test that's within the book. Um, so in the book, it shows a, func a, a test function that looks like this test that the meaning of life is 42 expect equal blah 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 um there's a, a newer syntax available within test that which i really like which um is a way of using kind of it's like the the language of behavior driven development within r which is quite nice so you're describing some um aspects of your app and then for, for that component of your app, you put in a variety of different it clause, which says, so for example, here, we might be describing a function that computes the meaning of life. And we have a little clause in there that says it is always 42. And the, the, the kind of expectation check that you, that you have within tests. So that's equivalent to that but I, I kind of prefer this way of writing tests now in 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 r um but that's been available since test that three i think um but yeah it's really nice um what sorry federica sorry uh, what is the uh, 42 <laughs> it's always 42 sorry this is um yeah if um it's uh, uh it's from a it's from a book it's like a kind of um um it's from a douglas adams book from like the 60s it, it's like a kind of in joke amongst computing um sites um in the book um a a, a traveler goes across galaxies in the universe to find out that to to try and find out what the meaning of life is and finds out that the meaning of life is 42. Um, and Thank you. It's, so it's, uh, yeah, it, I, I don't know, without the, <laughs> without, 
<laughs> without knowing the book and stuff, this kind of stuff falls flat on people. And uh, yeah, um, anyway, so that comes from a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, uh, and um, kind of science fiction and geeky comedy it run the, rife through. It was uh, the... It was the supercomputer, correct? They they ask yeah. the meaning of life, and the computer come back uh, comes back with it and just says forty two. Uh, it's I remember not watching the show, but uh, reading the book, and I, I recall that uh, scene of of now it all makes sense. I I, I I didn't know the reference of the meaning of life in forty two until you mentioned that. I quickly looked it up and put two and two together. <laughs> I find it quite interesting though, because like a lot, a lot of the time. I, I know of terms from computing, but don't necessarily know the cultural reference and things like that. And occasionally I'll be reading a book and, and realize that that might be the source of the thing. So I'm reading a book at the moment. I, I don't even know whether it is the source or whether it's referring to something older called Rakanon's World, where Ansible is mentioned. And I don't know whether that might be a, a, an older term but it's the first time i've seen it in an actual book but anyway that's another computing but, uh, sorry i have another um, one more question mm, when you yeah. when you test that so when you test the function yeah what do you actually do so basically i make a function like this like function for uh -huh, to yeah. describe blah 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 what is test that actually doing um well uh i can pull my r studio up and we can have a look um we already so, talked about this no you know oh, yeah, yeah. they may be shiny and everything i didn't have much time to look at that but for example today i was trying to make some functions at some i did it but then i i wanted to test that function and yeah. um, I didn't do it because um, I didn't want to uh, get inside the thing and spend all the time trying understanding the, uh, how that worked and uh, losing time instead of doing other things. So, but we already talked about that. And we said that uh, that was for testing the function, the, a function yeah, to yeah. see if that worked. And he made um, the... The package, uh, I don't remember very well how, but in some, uh, uh, so basically I write where the, the, the issues in the function um, are or something like that, if I'm saying wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically, well, well the, the, the purpose of tools like test that, there's, um, uh, the, well, there's usually, there's several reasons why you might want to test your code using a tool like that. Um, so firstly, it um, gives you a bit more confidence that the function, that, you know, the functions or the classes or uh, things like that that you've written are behave as you expect them to when provided appropriate um, inputs and, and things like that. Um, so for example, you might, define a function that takes some argument and multiplies it by 10 then then you'd provide a range of different test cases so if you provide the argument 2 to that function the output should be 20 if you provide the output 3 it should be 30 if you provide a character to it there should be an error um and Oh, oh, damn it. Where are we? You're, uh, you're testing the mathematical function, right? The algorithm yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're passing um, it a variable and then providing the expected output. Yeah. And, and when you provide something inappropriate, uh, so for example, this is a test using a non-numeric argument. Um, sorry, I, it, it purposely written to be incorrect. Um, maybe that would be better if I wrote the test like that. So, um, when you've prov so here we've provided a numeric input to a function that expects a numeric input, but the value that was computed by that function 
isn't the same as the value that we have given it as the kind of expected value. When that happens, test that will throw an error and will say that your function currently isn't behaving as you specified in your tests. And, and these kind of tests, you can run them automatically in uh, on GitHub or in, um, um, you know, Circle CI or something like that. And um, they will check to see if, you know, when, when someone uh, adds some code to your repository, whether the tests that already exist continue to run and whether the new tests that they've added continue, it, 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 you know, pass as well. Um, so these, it's a way of catching, um, of, of catching um, errors before they've happened. But also, I think it's quite it's quite nice in that it gives you an extra set of documentation. So if you want to learn how to use something, it's good to have the you know if the tests are available and they explain what the expected behavior of a, a function or a class or a you know a workflow or a pipeline or something like that is. Um, you've got a kind of use case written up in the tests already that you can go and copy if you want. Um, but yeah, so the, the purpose is just to kind of um, double check that your code behaves the way that it does and, you know, catch any, you know, regressions that might happen um, if someone changes the code. You know, it's quite easy to make a, a, a simple mistake that might cause a, a, a problem. Anyway, um, so that's the essence of testing. Um, there are a, a certain tweaks that you need to apply to make it work for the reactive setting in which Shiny runs. So um, I don't know, do, does that, um, sorry, does that answer your question? question yeah yes yeah, thanks okay, yes yes thanks um so um so this function shiny test server is uh something that was added in in shiny version 1.5 and it's um what it does is it gives you the it gives you the opportunity to run the server function from a shiny um, app, set the various inputs and whatnot, and, you know, change uh, values and stuff, and see how the other aspects of the server function will respond to changes in the inputs. Um, the way it's written here, um, it, it, sorry, this is the book on the left-hand side. Um, the way it's written is it's kind of written to test a whole app here, but in the Gollum, in, in the book that, that we're working through, you're, you would typically be testing smaller chunks of an app. So you might isolate a particular module and test that that behaves as you expect, rather than testing the whole app at, at, at one go, just so that you're not, you know, so that your tests are a bit more, um, a bit, you know, smaller and um, run faster and things like that. So I rewrote this. So this would be the server function for a whole app because it's defined as a kind of function of input, output and session. The newer version of, of how to define a, the server function for a module uh, looks like this. So you have a function of an ID and that function returns a module server object. Um, and within that, there's a, the, the, the kind of function of input, output and session is kind of nested within that server object. Um, uh, so, I, so I've basically rewrote that and I've added in a little um, argument as well to show how you can um, provide arguments to, to, to 
to modules and, and test them as well. Um, so you would, um, yeah, so, so this returns a server function and this is how we test it. So um, you set up a test server, you pass that the server function and then within the kind of body of your test server, you set the various inputs. So here, this is a, a module where if any change happens to an input called selector, then a reactive value called uh, val the <laughs> the reactive value r dollar value will be updated to contain ten times whatever your selector was. So it's a, a fairly you know it, it's as simple a module as you could possibly have. But um, so what we're doing here. So this is the first kind of expectation. We're setting the selector to one. And um, once that has bubbled through the server function and updated the values that it's expected to, that ex to, to, to influence, we check that the updated R dollar value is now equal to 10. So 10 times the selector value. And then similarly, we do the same, but setting selector to two. Um, so I'll just have to let the dog out the room. Um, go on. Right. Uh, I, I expanded upon the module that they've defined here just so that I could show how you can use modules that, that ha also take arguments as, uh, so for example, if the mo the, this 10 multiplier in here, if that wasn't a fixed value, it might be something that is passed in from above by whichever module imports this module, but sorry, not calls this module. Um, and the way you do that is by adding a multiplier argument at the, you know, in the, in the definition of your server function. Um, and the way you test that is by providing a arguments list into your core when when you set up this test server function. So test server is a function provided by Shiny that's only recently been added. Um, and this way of, of of adding arguments in as well uh, is is quite a neat system for. Um, you can actually pass in reactive values and things like that as well, but I didn't go that far here. And then, so if we set the inputs for the selector value to three, and with this fixed value of multiplier being 15, the R dollar value is should now be 45 because the, argu the multiplier argument is multiplied by the input selector. So, so, so what have we seen so far? We've seen testing business logic, which are the non-reactive functions. We've seen testing the server-side logic, which is the kind of how one input connects to another and how things are updated in response to changes in values. Um, the next thing that you might want to test is the user interface. So in particular, this kind of test, although it can test um, how uh, a value might update in response to a change in another value, it, there's no part of the front end of the app being tested here. In particular, like, um, pe you know, people could click on buttons and things like that. Um, or input whatever values they want um, and a lot of those events are controlled by the, the sort of javascript running in the browser um, and those kind of those kind of things aren't something that we can test from the server side so you need a tool that will 
uh, it, that is able to manipulate your app as if a user was interacting with a browser session. Um, and the tool that the book describe in the most detail is a tool called Puppeteer. Um, if I open that web page, so Puppeteer is, uh, oh God. Um, so it's a tool developed by Google and it, um, and, and using it, it's like, it, it's a way of, um, you can run a script on your computer. It will um, load up uh, Chrome and run various commands against your app. And then, you know, you'll be able to, um, you know, you'll be able to check that the appropriate buttons are available and that clicking in one place opens up, uh, you know. So, for example, like if, you, if you've got a, um, let's open Hexmake. What, where was it again? Um, Hexmake. Uh, so Russ, while you're, while you're yeah. starting this, if mm -hmm. I can add a comment about Puppeteer and, and, and how the relation of that and test that works in R. So, Frederica, what we're, what we're looking at here is kind of the, the middle action, right? So we know we've got a server-side code. We know we have our UI. Okay, so that's, that's the, the handshake between the two. What we're doing with Puppeteer, or at least from the user's perspective, the UI's perspective, is now passing inputs, uh, passing data into uh, the application using Puppeteer and then recording those calls being made by the server. If you combine that with the test that side of things of, of what uh, Russ was mentioning before, now you're, you're seeing this uh, automated build relationship or automated call relationship between uh, your two applications, <clears throat> server side and client side, and then capturing the middle uh, or recording the middle of that uh, data exchange. Yeah. So you can go back and look at your two log files or your two recorded files and say, I passed this from the UI. This is what uh, uh, happened on the, on the test end. Russ, I can't recall, uh, it, 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 is it time stamped? Is it uh, the, uh, the internal clock when, when you're running these services? There's I, a way that you can uh, correlate. I don't. I don't actually know, to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I, but I, to be honest, I, I'm less experienced at the front end testing than I am with Agreed. the back end stuff. But um, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, if so, basically. Uh, so the thing I wanted to show you. So for example, in this app here, um, the the things that Puppeteer would test. So you'd write a script that describes a typical use case for, for your app. So you might say, if I click on this tab here, it should open, you know, this panel should become visible and then I'd be able to click on browse and whatever. Um, so um, one of the real one of the real selling points for Puppeteer is the uh, the recorder, um, which means if you're if you're working in Chrome or Chromium or uh, one of the things built up, one of the things built upon Chromium, one of the different browsers, um, you can um, you can load the website that you're wanting to test against. So Puppeteer isn't, it's not shiny specific uh, by any means. You can run tests, uh, run scripts against any website that, that you, you like. Um, and what it will do is it will, you know, as, as the script opens, it will open the website that you want to look at, click the various buttons and, and you know, enter in the appropriate um, text boxes or whatever that you've encoded in your script and then um and yeah and so that's fine the, but 
writing out those scripts yourself would be pretty um, long-winded. And the there's a tool uh, comparable to the shiny test record session thing um, called the headless recorder. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how, how to run this in a, in a little bit. Um, so, um, so let's see if I pull hex make over here. Um, but yeah, so what this recorder will do is it will, um, you'll have your website open or your app open because it can work on a, like a local, um, port or, or, or something like that so that you can work on your shiny apps. Um, it will wait for you as the user to click on something or, you know, or whatever, and record the, the JavaScript code that would be required to replicate that action in a, um, a, a script that you can later run. Um, so if I, what was the, I had a test, I've got a test script that I kind of made earlier on, like first thing this morning. Um, Chrome extend, blah, blah, scripts for, yeah, Puppeteer. And, and uh, there's another tool called Playwright. I don't know anything about Playwright, but it seems to be exactly the same type of thing as Puppeteer. Um, uh, it says in the book that to use Puppeteer, uh, it won't record text input or anything like that. So it won't imp it won't record you writing text into a box when you're on a website or an app, and that's not true anymore, at least. But when you enter text into a box, you have to click tab so that the text input gets um, saved as well. Um, so okay, so I've got HexMake opened. I'm going to load. Uh, this is just the instructions for running. Um, the headless recorder. It says, once you've got this installed as a Chrome extension, you click on the icon for the headless recorder. Then, oh, oh restart. Then you click on this big red kind of recorder session button. Um, we Let's go in and da, da, da. we'll go in there, change that to some other um, package. Oh, you have to press tab because I've typed in some values. Uh, let's have that as 10 and that will probably do. And we'll stop recording by press, pressing the stop recording button. Now that has, um, create that's already created a script i can copy that to my um thing and i can look at that if i pull over uh let's, have, let's see yeah and if i so this is if i save that as like template JS. Right, so it, now because it's got a JS extension, it knows it's JavaScript. It looks like this. Now I did this earlier on, and it didn't it didn't work particularly well. Um, so this is the the code that my browser has saved. So we can look through it. There's no comments or anything like that. So you have to kind of divine what it's doing. Um, here we're starting a new puppeteer session we are opening a browser and then navigating to the hex make page um, we're setting the size of the browser and then what have we done here we're waited for something yeah so the summary box is manage name when i clicked that it opened up this box so it has to wait for that manage name thing to exist before i can click on it then it has to wait 
for this package name text box to be available before I can click in there. Uh, so then I've clicked in there. Then um, what am I doing? I'm oh, is it not saved my text? I thought I, I thought I tab completed that correctly. Oh no, no it is. it's line yeah, 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 it's down yeah. at the bottom. Um, oh yeah, I must have done something twice or something like that. Um, yeah, so here what we're doing it's it's saying that you know on the page you have typed this value into this selector this text box here so that all looks quite sensible now i did the same thing earlier on uh if i open um, um examples chapter 11 and the the same effectively the same script so i've selected the same selector and updated the text box i've fixed this slightly because if you see the difference between the two all this code here has has to be wrapped in a asynchronous block otherwise these are await commands don't make any sense i'm not a javascript expert by any means um and the way I worked that out was by looking at what the code looked like in the book for the, 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 the same kind of example and just copied the bit of code that was missing. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I, to be honest, I don't, I think it would have took me a while to work out. So I, um, so I, I copied the same kind of script here, but I've also found some um, examples of uh puppeteer script that where did my where did my notes for the book go oh yeah there um yeah so i i found a blog post that had a range of other examples as well um and they were i mean they were quite neat as well so um i mean this seems to be funded by puppeteer anyway so it kind of um duty bound to be good uh, examples uh yeah so i saw this uh, asynchronous code wrapping all the await things and figured i ought to change my code right so that's how you write a puppeteer script or how you get your browser to write one for you um uh that's fine um in order to run that again um so if I go into the terminal in um, our studio, my, we use the fixed version. Um, so because this is a JavaScript script, um, you have to run it using node. Eggs, oops. Um, pools. And that will run. It runs to completion and doesn't print anything to the command line, um, which is is fine if you know that that's what it's expected to do. So if I change this so that it tries to find a selector that isn't there, um, it will run, but will throw an error because it can't find the selector that i've specified that it ought to be able to um so it's all you know when you're writing a test it's always good to write a you know see that the test could fail um, um so that that kind of that's that's how you run these tests so for the you know you could write these kind of scripts and stuff and put them in your inst directory or something like that within a, a an r package you'd need a, a a node environment on your local computer or on the ci server or something like that so that you can run them against your app um which i mean i don't know it, it's probably 
a lot of work. Well, not not that it's a lot of work. It's a lot of moving parts to handle when you're already handling um, your own R packages, possibly some um, database stuff, and you know what. Um, the the fewer fewer different languages in any project, the better, you know. Um, so. Um, Oh yeah, and also sorry. There's a so so I modified the script and and saw that it fails. Um, so if any of those selectors that were involved in that test was renamed or something like that, the scripts would all start failing, which makes these kind of front end tests a little bit flaky because they depend on you know the precise naming of your modules and the precise naming of the, the the elements that you select and things like that that's not a i mean that's not a huge issue but it does mean that if you refactor your your app you have to make sure that the tests are also refactored and stuff as well um, there's another tool where you can use puppeteer.launch with headless false and if I run that script, I might as well show you well. Um, what is it? Headless. False. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I'll run that. Um, and it should. Ooh. Russ, do you want to bring over your R Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I can. Yeah, okay. I can do that. I just didn't no want my. R Studio obscure in the browser when this is running. So what I've done is, in this line here, I've changed it to headless false. And headless means that it will be running in the browser, but you won't be able to see it. Headless With headless false, it means that it will open a page in your browser and you'll be able to see what it's doing. But it might be doing, uh, it might be doing things at a speed that's far too fast for human eyes to comprehend. So I'm not sure. How, oh, yeah, yeah, no, it works too fast. Um, well, I'm, if, if, I pull this, if I pull this over here again and try running that, oh, it's opened on the wrong screen. <laughs> well, anyway, you're just going to have to trust me that uh, with headless false, it will open a browser, do some things that you won't be able to see, and then we'll close the browser faster than you can even blink. Um, Right, anyway, uh, so that's Puppeteer. Puppeteer is fine, um, and there's Shiny Test if you want something that's kind of more bespoke to Shiny. Um, the, uh, like I was saying, the, the, the issue with using Puppeteer is that you're tied to the JavaScript, um, tied to having JavaScript on your test server. Um, which might not be a huge issue for some people, but it seems like a little bit more to manage. So if there's an R-specific way of running Puppeteer-like tests, then uh, maybe that would be a good thing. And um, these two packages with kind of really difficult to pronounce names um, provide that. So there's C R R R I and C R R R Y, which provide the what's called the Chrome Remote Interface. So this is um, so these are R packages that can interface with a Chrome browser or a Chromium-based browser, um, where rather than writing the scripts in JavaScript and whatnot, you can write your test scripts using R. It will, the, the, the packages themselves will run those R test scripts against the browser and you'll be able to use test that and expectations and things like that on values that you pull back out of the browser. Um, so, uh, I, I took a I took a similar example, but this time pulling uh, using the 
so sorry yes again so i'm using the hex make website rather than a local app but um so did i did, 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 let's have a see I, I definitely wrote a test in here yeah so i'll put i'll pull over my r studio again and um so what this is this is the code you'd write to set up a, a, a test, um, uh, a, a t you know, a, a, an object that can test against the browser. You tell it what port you want to run on and things like that. Um, then you wait for the Shiny app to be ready. Then you... Um, uh, you might update some values um, and, oh, did I run this? I wonder, hold on, did I run this? Sorry, I, I can't remember whether I ran it against, yeah, no, I must have run it against the website. Right, okay, um, sorry. Um, so to install um, CRRY, is puppeteer like but the the tools it provides are tailored for shiny and it i think it is based on this package which is a kind of lower level tool if you don't if you don't mind me interrupting i think yeah, what yeah. is going on with these two r packages so if we look at puppeteer as being a third party into this uh, arena of testing that we're talking yeah, about yeah. it's not r related there's nothing going on with r directly but our compiled JavaScript. So when you when you call on the Shiny Run, it starts your web server, right, or your session. Uh, it starts the the Shiny. Usually, it's in a in a a, a local uh, host type URL, and so you're providing that port. Your browser opens up, it does some testing, and it closes again. Puppeteer being a third party relying on Node.js is not going to update your compiled uh, uh, namespace changes of your variable names, right? Mm -hmm. So if you change, modify, update your, your uh, R side, uh, both server language and, and, and UI language, if you modify those, those names, but you're still using Puppeteer as the test feature, obviously you're gonna have a bunch of namespace problems, right? Because it's a Node.js server running your web host, blah, blah, blah. If you use the, I, I, I may be pronouncing these incorrectly, but I'm saying cry or cry, uh, yeah, yeah. depending. The format is now going to be managed inside your session, your RStudio uh, environment session. So the web server calls out and, and pulls on Chrome or Chromium uh, yeah. to create that instance and then is passing the compiled JavaScript namespace variables. Does, I hope I'm making sense yeah, yeah, with yeah. the yeah, relationship in one being third party, it doesn't update. So therefore there's a good chance that your, your uh, particular test functions are gonna fail, uh, especially if you've updated. Whereas using these internal to R, your namespaces are going to be known to your, your path variable or to your, your environment variable. Mm -hmm. Sorry, environment, not variable. Um, yeah. And so now you're, you're passing like language back and forth. So your, your tests are going to be able to validate and or uh, confirm whether or not your code base is accurate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, um, uh, sorry, uh, Federica, did you have? Uh, sorry, I have a question as well. Uh, what, what, um, why uh, I will need to uh, record um that's uh, the part of the browser why why i would need to to put that in my in my app in what in what condition for for showing well, the, the, yeah i mean the the purpose is so that you have a um uh, uh, a script that you can replay uh, as and when you need um so uh that that script that was generated by the um recorder um you can run you, say you modify your app um and then run run those tests again 
uh, you can you can run those test scripts again. Um, so the, I mean, the alternative is to write the um, write down the commands yourself, um, and 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 in that way generate the the the. the I test see. Script. I see. It's it's like like recording a model in Excel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. something like that. But. Um, on in the, uh, on the browser yeah yeah so can i uh, i'll just show you this uh, example with cry um uh, so this is the code to initiate a um a kind of a, a, a test instance they call it right so we'll do that we'll run that um and it's running against my chromium browser in a headless setting. So I can't see that on my browser at the moment, but um, this here um, tells it, this command tells it, wait for all the kind of reactive changes that are happening in the app to, to finish. Um, so we can run that, da, 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 shiny is still running. Um, and then this is a simple test. So it's the same thing that I wrote, uh, that I recorded the Puppeteer script for. So um, I identify this selector that allows you to change the package name on Hexmake, and I change it to the name of one of my packages. Um, then uh, I can use this code here, which is jQuery syntax. And what it does is it extracts this is the the same selector that you'd use to um this is the the selector on the web page that currently holds the name of the package that is um presented to the user on in the in the hex sticker thing um so what we do um we we're going to use this command here to set a shiny input value so it's going to set the value for that selector to Dupree and then we're going to wait for shiny to run and we're going to extract the whatever string is associated with that selector after we've updated it so really this is a trivial test um, we change the, the, the text that's stored in that selector, and then we poll that selector to see what text is currently stored in it. And I, ideally, it will update to this package name. Um, but I've, I've run this, <laughs> and the reason I'm, I'm presenting it this way is because the test fails. Um, now, the test fails because this function here this method shiny set input what it will do is it will set the input value that's sent to the server that sent to the shiny server side but it doesn't set the value that's actually stored in the user facing browser uh, setting if you want to update that value and see that updating it has so so you could you could use this you could use this function if say um you wanted to set a, a value and then see an update to some other uh part of the app so if i wanted to say um um Oh, I can't think of a good example. I couldn't think of a good example in the uh, in the Hex Make app, at least. Um, if you want to, if you want to run a test where you um, update the um, the text that's stored in it, and then in such a way that you can then um, look at that value as well. What I did was I wrote a, a little JavaScript. So this is the jQuery for reading a value from a um, from a 
from the HTML. And this is the jQuery for reading for setting a value. Um, so here we read the name of the package that's currently stored in um, in that that uh, in the DOM for uh, whatever. And here we can set it. So uh, we do test blah call JS and we set the package name to Dupree and then we do a kind of trivial test where we pull out that name and check that it's the same as we set it to. Um, there are much more valid and useful tests that you could do using this. But what I quite like about this is that you can um, that that you can you can basically run everything and only need the minimum amount of JavaScript. So this is um, jQuery syntax uh, rather than having to understand how to construct a whole JavaScript um, script. Um, so yeah, so updating values that are sent to the shiny backend is different from updating the values that are visible in the UI. But uh, yeah, uh, but I think these I think these tools are quite useful. Now I um, sorry, I'll move this out of the way again. Um, there is a related tool called Shiny Test. Oh, sorry, I thought I'd added some. Um, uh, but yeah, um, Shiny Test is oh, that's weird. It's not updated. Um, Shiny Test is almost identical to the, the 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 workflow that we've just described using cry and using puppeteer so for puppeteer what you did was you opened up a website you clicked around on it and recorded a script and then at a later stage you rerun that script and check that you know it runs without any errors or anything like that um shiny test um what it does is you can open an app um click around set some values and things like that it will record the events the 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 things that you've done against that app in a, a script that can be rerun and it will also record a kind of snapshot image of what the app looked like after you'd finished your um your kind of use case and what that means is when you rerun that test script it will compare the image of the app at the end of running the test script to the stored um, image that you you made when you initially uh, prepared that test script so that there's no kind of um, regression against you but mm, you know the difficulty there is if you make a slight change in the color scheme or in the fonts used or something like that it will identify that as a difference even if you know all the text all the content all the buttons and things like that are still the same ryan have you uh much yeah, experience I, with no no i haven't i haven't experienced a, a shiny test at all but i completely comprehend what exactly the reason you want to stay within your R Studio session to test all of your your code mm. base. What I what I unmuted for, or, or what I wanted to add, mm. is this almost like a like kind of like a reprex kind of comparison? Like, and I'm I'm, I'm probably confusing by using a, the term reprex, but I'm trying to say that that you're recording some interactivity and saving it. So in most cases, you want to send that to another user and say, this is my problem. Can you help me figure out exactly mm. what my environment looks like? So you can run the exact same uh, scenario. I, 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 yeah, I can see that would be quite valuable to be honest, but it's not, I don't think that's the, um, the same um, code or the same logic, the same objectives yeah. of what, what that's doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I can, I, I think I'd, I think that might be 
Um, because the problem the problem with shiny test is it's making a snapshot at the very end, so you're not necessarily seeing every you know a snapshot every so often or or, or something like that after each command or something. So it may not be the best way to record um, user uh, problems that users have had with your app. I don't, I don't know, uh, but yeah, I, I think. Certainly, if 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 you can use it to replicate um, an error that a user has described to you, then that would be quite useful. Um, and also, like the snapshots that you generate with Shiny Test can be updated as as time goes on. So if if there is a bug identified. Um, when you fix that bug, you can update the the snapshot that that is generated by the the test script. Um, yes, uh, I I I pulled out um, the HexMake um, code base, hoping to be able to use it to uh, run shiny test <laughs> record test but it's just caused all sorts of problems so i'm afraid the example that i was hoping to to work through because the the problem with shiny test is um it's all driven by your r studio session um and recording the you know the changes and, and things like that you can't you can't do uh against the against the website for the app or something um so you know i i basically couldn't install hexmake such that i could run it isolated on my computer uh for, and I, I have no idea why that's the case um anyway so that's shiny test uh, although i've not been able to show you how it works um and then there was another tool called shiny load test which again i, I i've not ran um for for hex make but it's based on us based on uh w w what you can do with shiny load test is how i i isolate determine how your app behaves when you have 10 users 100 users 300 users um and yeah i mean it, it, it's very powerful I, I wasn't able to to set it up for an example today, I'm afraid, but um, but it, it's yeah, it's quite a, a neat tool. One thing I did find interesting though was this um, using if if your app is hosted on a in a Docker container, you can pull statistics from that container that tell you how much memory and how much processing time and things like that are being used by the container. And in that way, on your local computer, you'll be able to get a better sense of how a server would behave when multiple users are using your app. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's quite neat. Um, yeah, so the, the other section of, of this chapter, which I haven't written any notes up for, um, is on reproducible environments um, on the package rnv and on docker um, and the, how one complements the other. Um, so rnv is a way of locking down the dependencies, the, you know, the R specific dependencies of an app. And it does it by ensuring that the you know, the specific R packages, the versions thereof and, and things like that are all um, defined and documented within your within your repo for, for your app. Um, it's, it's a neat tool, but I, I, I don't really want to go over it, to be honest. Um, but I, I'm happy to, to, to talk about it in the, 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 the chat room because it's something I've got quite a bit of experience with. Um, Docker, I really don't have much experience with, but it's a way of kind of isolating 
the running of your app even one step further so things like the system dependencies things like the you know the version of curl that you've got installed the version of um if, if you're dependent on um a particular version of SQLite or MongoDB or something like that, locking down them dependencies as well, um, and also isolating the running of your app from whatever you might have installed on the rest of your computer or that is installed on the server upon which you want to run it. Um, it's a way of ensuring that the app as it runs on your computer is as close as possible to how it will run on the CI server that you run your tests on or the um, deployment server that you use to host the app. Um, and yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds great, but I really, I'm really, really a, a, a total novice with Docker. So it's really not for me to, to, to present as a, um, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert either, but <laughs> I will state this, that if you run Docker on a Linux host machine, the mm. bare bones machine, or, or, you know, you're, you're running Linux right now. So um, you don't need any of the extra flavored tools to translate anything. It's just going to run native, right? If yeah. you do this on Mac or in windows, you're going to require the Docker desktop, which is nothing more than really a virtual machine of a Linux uh, yeah. I wouldn't even consider it emulator. It's just a, a uh, it's, it's, it's creating a, a Linux virtual machine that you can add all your Docker content to. If we are discussing or deploying any of these test that's puppeteer, uh, shiny server, shiny load. If you're talking about any of these packages, I would only make a recommendation to a person to use Linux as the, the uh, uh, environment that you're developing or creating in, uh, mm -hmm. only because it's all native. Docker, all of these RStudio applications and packages, yeah. et cetera. It just makes your life as a developer easier when you branch off into Mac or into Windows and you try to deploy the same logic, you're gonna run into some kind of funny behavior within some of these uh, services. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not an expert, but I do know that there's enough of a difference between Docker on Linux versus Docker on anything else. Uh, it yeah. is definitely yeah. different. Right. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it there because I've got, because um, my partner's working this evening and I've got a family to go and <laughs> um, look after. Um, yeah, great. I, 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 these, the, I, I did the testing chapter for Master in Shiny as well. And um, there's so much scope to talk about in this. And I, I know that a lot of people aren't quite so um, keen on testing as, as I am. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, there are lots of cool tools for Shiny. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, I, I, yeah, there will be more by the end of the year, I imagine, as well. Um, yeah, OK, great. Thanks. Um, so next week, we don't have a meeting. Uh, because uh, the clocks change in the States before they change for Europe. So it makes everything a bit disorganized. Um, there's, there's a handful of chapters left in the book. Um, there's one on building and deployment, I think. And then there's a, a few chapters on like, um, front end matters, CSS and JavaScript. There's things on optimizing the speed and the memory profile and things of, of your app as well. But the vast bulk of the book, I think we've covered now. Um, and yeah, uh, but it'll be a couple of weeks. And uh, I don't know, I mean, if, if either of you fancy doing a chapter in two weeks time, that would be brilliant. Um, I'd, I'd like to give a stab at the, the deployment side, and it goes okay, back yeah. to the necessity. When we first mm -hmm. started the book club, I made a comment about trying to, to port or route uh, a web RStudio session into yeah. a Shiny server being on the same uh, application, how that relationship would work, uh, whether I'm pointing it 
to a web server out in the ether, or if it's just local to the same machine, how I actually pass that from one service to another. Um, if it would be okay, um, I can sign up for Chapter 13 deployment application. Okay. Uh, would yeah. that be? Yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. Um, there is a version control chapter. I saw that. It's yeah. really, really kind of, it's a bit brief to be honest and i i mean i i'm happy to discuss it in the um uh, chat room rather than as a you know presented chapter i don't know i mean unless um it's something federica that you feel we like to you'd you'd like us to cover um yes why not yes okay uh, okay right well then yeah we'll um we'll do the version control and then we'll do the deployment chapter. So, um, okay, cool. Um, right, great. Well, I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time then. Um, brilliant. Right, okay, great. Uh, bye. I'll see you. you. <laughs> see you then. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye.